Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon, and this is John and Max. And Hi. Welcome, welcome to the first ever interview. Um, so my questions for you, John, okay. are for how long has uh, Alien Arena been active as an indie game studio or a core, ga a core game? Um, so Core formed um, originally in 1999, um, but it didn't really officially uh, become an actual company um, until 2006. Um, basically, Alien Arena at that time had been out, and we had some revenue stream, minor revenue stream coming in. It's just like a, enough to like pay for little bits of things, advertising or uh, game servers or whatever. Um, at that time, you know, I formed the LLC, Limited Liability Company at the time. And I guess that's been 11 years now. Oh, nice. And yeah. uh, how many games have you developed? Um, since that time, it's only been Alien Arena. Uh, before that, I developed a game called Alteria. I will and have to I had, check that one um, out. Yeah, you might want to wait now. <laughs> we're actually going to reboot that one at some point once we're done with Alien Arena. Uh, cool. That's the plan. You know, if this takes off and allows us to become an actual game studio where we can, you know, dedicate a little more uh, professional time. Well, then we better get promoting you quick smart. <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically been those two games. I, I, you know, way back in the day, you know, I made little Pac-Man replicas and centipede things on Commodore 64s and PCs and, and whatnot. But uh, those are like really the only two uh, modern games, I would say. And I did mine for Doom and, and uh, Quake back in the day, too. Very nice. I will have to check your video out. If I sound bad... Don't mind me. I thrash no, my voice. <clears throat> um, where is Core Games uh, located? Uh, well, my home office right now is basically the central hub. We're spread all over the place. Um, and, you know, at the moment, we're kind of all volunteers um, until this thing goes out on Steam and then, you know, we can. Uh, see where it goes from there, uh, but it's based in Frederick, Maryland. Nicely it's done. A small Appalachian town, right at the right at the foothills of the mountains. For what platforms do you develop games? Uh, it's Windows and Linux. Um, we do. Uh, we're trying to get um, uh, you know Mac support, um, but. Uh, we haven't had a lot of people that actually, at various times, we've had it compiling on, on Macs and, and sort of working. Um, I do have Macs at my disposal now, so hopefully that becomes, you know, a, you know, a part of that. Uh, no current plans to or to mobile devices, um, at least for this game, just because it just wouldn't really play very well. You know, an uh, arena first-person shooter on a mobile <laughs> platform would be kind of it'd yeah, be worse it'd be, than pokemon go yeah i mean there may be some opportunities i am actually starting to get into android development and, and ios development so good i have be, an android phone yeah there you go <laughs> so, yeah so you know right now it's just mostly you know desktop that's yeah. That's a good starting platform, actually. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and, you know, from what I can tell so far, just like my little Android apps that I've, you know, made, and I, I, I've made a small 3D render. Um, yeah, it's it's not really that difficult for the transition, actually. So I have some ideas for some little games for Android, some, some mindless things that I can... I haven't heard about this. <laughs> I look forward to it. Okay. Uh, how many people are currently working for Core? 
Well, it's um right now it's myself, Max. Um, we have uh, Victor, who you've talked to. Um, those are probably the three main people right now. One of our um, past main contributors is uh, under the weather. Uh, he's had some health problems, so he's not been very active lately, but he played a key role in getting it to where it is today. Uh, so we have somebody who's sort of taken over his duties at the moment. And um, so you know, there's probably like three or four other kind of somewhat active contributors in various ways that, uh, you know, like running our IRC channels or uh, admin the message boards or hosting servers. Actually, it's probably a little more than three or four. It's maybe close to like a dozen in total, I guess. It's hard. It's hard to count for sure because people come and go. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were the sources of inspiration for making Alien Arena? Oh man! So uh, I guess it goes back to like my childhood and <laughs> movies like Invasion of the Saucer Man and um, uh, just like classic '50s sci-fi type stuff, and then you know the Mars Attacks comics and movies and uh, War of the Worlds. You know, just any kind of like even Star Trek, just that kind of retro cheesy sci-fi were you ever into babylon 5 at all yeah babylon 5 that show's great <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. oh yeah uh, just any kind of like um i think i was trying to think of the one that's got the uh, oh yeah uh, doctor who of course ah. i actually when i first did the game i did have alex running around in the game <laughs> Uh, was Alien Arena planned to be what it has become? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe in, in, in some way, yeah. Uh, I always kind of wanted it to, you know, kind of morph into something a little more uh, gritty and detailed and but I guess as game engines evolved, you know, it, you know, I had no idea that we could end up doing something the way that, you know, the way it turned out. Mm. Um, back in those days, there was a lot less to work with. And, you know, that was, I guess, 2003 when I, I first started planning it. And, uh, but, you know, it's evolved over the, over the feature, you know, over the years. And, um, you know, it's been you now. This is like the second major reboot where all the artwork was just completely scrapped and, and done, you know, done from scratch again. That's always the case with games. It reboots yeah. and then loses, mo yeah. loses momentum and, yeah. and then yeah. picks up again. Yeah, sure. You know, and Max, you know, he's keeps introducing new, new technology. So, you know, I have to rebuild everything when he comes up with something like, you know, terrain rendering. Hmm. You know, but shadows and stuff. And you gotta slow it on like down, that. Max. Slow Let's it on build down. It. I, I've heard that before, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Yeah. clears throat> did you use an engine for Alien Arena? Well, we started with Quake Two. Um, there's not much really. Well, the renderer there's almost nothing left. From Quake 2 in there, other than that, the map format is still the BSP format, but you could say that about a lot of engines. You know, a lot of them, at least that's how still use um, I know Unity is a little different where they throw like just mesh soup out there. But, um, you know, the ones that play fast uh, and furious, they're going to use BSP, like, you know, the Source Engine, Unreal Engine, and uh, not sure about Crytek. You know, I'm sure oh, there's Crytek, a lot. Crytek's a pig. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably mesh soup. <laughs> but, I mean, we can do mesh soup now, too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's constantly evolving. So, you know, we're kind of, I mean, you know, this week we're already, you know, just here we are, like, trying to, like, get the game done, wrap more stuff up. Right. 
What I will say that we we're we're still using from Quake Two is is Quake the Quake games have it's hard to explain, but they have really tight controls. They really yeah. f- they really feel great to interact with, even just running around without you know properly playing the game, just running around in a map can be a whole lot of fun in these games. And uh, we've tried to keep uh, we've tried to keep that uh, from uh, from Quake Two as we continue to evolve the engine. We we still want to keep that Quake feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've compared you know like because I I've been researching other games too. Um, that you know, I, I feel what we're competing, you know, with on Steam, you yeah. know, in the genre, and they, especially the ones based uh, on on real engine, it feels like you're running with lead boots, and it even kind of looks like it too. It looks like everything moving in slow motion, and then you fire up a quake based game, and it's like everything's just flying around everywhere and hyper speed, and yeah, it's a different world. We'll see how Quake Champions is. It looks like it might be fairly fast, so maybe not quite the way traditional Quake was. Uh, why? Oh God, which question was I up to? Uh, what is the best thing about this engine? The best thing about it, um, I would say that we can render in pretty decent detail. Um, at an extremely high speed. Um, we, especially Max, has done a lot of work in optimizing the engine. Um, there's definitely like things that I implemented and then Max got hold of it and said, you know, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this better. And then I go look back at it and I can't figure out what he did, but. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I think that we can render, um, I, I will not say we can render. Well, we could render at the fidelity of, you know, say, you know, Unreal Engine four or four. You know, we could we could put content in there that was you know, forty ninety six by forty ninety six character textures or whatever size they're at now, and ten thousand poppies, and it would slow it down significantly. But um, you know, for what we're doing, we're using a lot of really good techniques to make it render fast. Um, and I, as long as we paint a pretty picture in terms of like what you're seeing on the screen and not necessarily be, you know, super high, high fidelity to where the engine runs slow or, you know, you're actually just kind of losing it anyway. Cause in a fast paced game, does it really matter if you have, you know, 20,000 polygons on a player character? Not really. You know, you're not, you can take a pretty screenshot, but in the game, nobody's going to notice that. And half the players are going to try to like turn and blur that all down anyway to make it run faster. So. Yeah. What, what I was going to say is that the, the, probably the best thing about the Quake engines as a place to start is that they're open source. Oh, yeah. You know, definitely. That's you don't, too, yeah. You don't have to screw around with getting a license. You don't have to yeah. pay, you don't have to pay $50,000 before you can even start. You can just start. Uh, and that, makes a huge difference to an indie studio. I think more, I think more studios should go that route of using an open source engine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's probably the most important aspect really, because that's, yeah, that's how our engine grew to begin with. You know, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that was in our engine, you know, was, or vice versa, we do something other engines would pick up on that. So the, the way the quake engines and, you know, especially in the heyday, um, in the late 2000s, um, you know, they were growing very quickly. Um, I don't know if there's like a lot right now other than ours and maybe a couple of others. I think the Damon engine is still pretty active. Um, Dark Places isn't very active, but uh, there's still some really good engines out there. They could definitely be starting points if someone wanted to you know, use them or use ours. Mm. Whoever is out there mowing their lawn right now, <laughs> I swear to God. Okay, so what is the worst thing about the engine? Uh, no scripting language. Yeah, that could be. That's yeah. That and, and the the fact that we haven't developed a lot of tools yet. 
Yeah. So you know, we're kind of like doing a lot of stuff by hand. Hopefully we'll have some, some decent tools eventually. Uh, but, you know, because, like, we're so small, you know, we just kind of focusing on getting the game and engine completed and then needs to be updated uh, yeah. significant. Or I think we unleash that on the public. But, uh, yeah, that would be the, probably, in my mind, the, uh, the weakest point. Yeah. Tool, tooling is a really good point because, you know, I guess for us, a game's not really complete until it's moddable, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for what platforms have you developed, and why did you choose these platforms? Uh, well, I guess yeah, like I mentioned before, Windows and Linux. Um, just basically, you know, with Windows, kind of have to, um, just because the market dictates that if you want to be successful in, in uh, a multiplayer game. Uh, Linux because it's open source and I love it and it runs nicely and uh, you know once it got ported to that you know it was pretty easy to keep it current and, and maintain. But those are our two you know those are the two market shares. You know Linux is a pretty decent even though it's a small market share. The people that use Linux there are a lot of gamers on Linux. Mm. So, and like I've said before, um, it helps to be a fish in a small pond. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's a big appeal for us to, because there aren't a lot. Um, I don't think there's a lot of native, not a lot of plans for some of these major games to actually be needed on it. I think some are, but. It, it's, it got better since Steam came to Linux, but it's yeah, still. It's definitely helping that. That's for sure. Yep. Uh, what was the overall goal for your product, and do you think you've achieved it yet? Oh, well, originally, I guess the goal was to do something cool and hopefully a lot of people play it. At one point, we did have, you know, when we were releasing on a fairly steady basis, I want to say, like, from around 2006 and seven. Right around to about 2012, we had a really solid player base then where, uh, you know, it wasn't ever huge, but I mean, there was, you know, there were days where it would average, you could get on and you could find about 50 or 60 players online at one point. Uh, there was a couple days that averaged up around 100. Um, but since then, it's dwindled completely away, to almost nothing, uh, which is understandable because we haven't had a release in four years. Yeah. Um, so, that was just kind of the main goal, uh, you know, and, and still really the same goal. Um, now it's just hopefully on Steam that if we can bring some revenue in, that um, maybe we can make this into like something that could be a little bit more full time uh, for some of us um, if we want to, and, and buy us some more time to develop the next game and uh, dedicate a lot of time to that. Uh, and, and really, the goal, it's just, I, honestly, the goal right now, to me, in my mind, it's very singular. It's just build the best arena first-person shooter game that, that's out there, if, if we can do that. And whether or not that's the prettiest or the best playing, uh, so, you know, that's just, we're just striving for it to be the best we can make it. And hopefully people will find it that way. I hope so too. I do apologize, but the noisy person out the front seems to have gotten closer. I can't hear anything, so it's yeah. Fine. yeah. It's gonna make uh, editing a pain in my ass, though. <laughs> um, what was the biggest challenge in the product of uh, Alien Arena? Well, I uh, I want Max to answer too. But personally, for me, I'll say it right out. Ragdoll physics. That kicked my butt for so long. And uh, luckily, I had somebody help me who was an expert in... But 
but uh, he was another developer who developed the model format, and he also is the developer of, or one of the developers of the um, Sour Brot game. Mm. And um, he and I, we spent a lot of nights. He lived in Las Vegas at the time, and we spent a lot of nights um, Skyping back and forth and talking on IRC, just trying to figure out. Uh, some of the little dragons that were hiding in the code and eventually it turned out to be something so ridiculously stupid to fix but that that was probably the biggest challenge i thought there was no way we could get it done but I, i'm sure max has probably got some, some better i mean like it's from a technical standpoint like some of the hardest thing was when we when we added terrain getting the physics right on that getting the collision detection right on the terrain yeah um, that was like, you know, it has to be perfect and it's, it's still, there's, we could honestly still improve it. There's still like some spots in a couple of terrain maps where you can get stuck, but, um, you know, getting that collision detection, right. So you can, uh, it, um, the engine we had before was very good for architecture. It was very good at rendering artificial structures, indoor maps, things like that. It wasn't so good with um, outdoor maps with like uh, smooth rolling terrain, organic shapes. Um, and so getting the physics right on that and getting the collision right on that took a long time. Um, really getting that whole thing right took a long time. A lot of, uh, you know, getting the light maps right. Um, but yeah, it happens all the time that like you 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 run into something that you just can't solve and you give up on it for a couple months and then you come back and it and it and it makes sense. You know, you just kind of have to understand that that's like part of the process and accept it and not let it discourage you. Um, but honestly, as far as like sheer hours, um, sheer man hours, I think some of the less technical stuff like art probably is harder. In, in a sense. Mm. I don't know if it's harder, but it's definitely, uh, yeah, it's, it's some kind of, sometimes can be a little, um, I think the first, you know, I, I like, I guess a good example would be like what I went through the last couple of weeks where I thought I had all the animations I wanted. And then I realized there was a couple of other ones I needed to add in. Then I, I had to go through each player model and re-export all of them and re-export all the weapon models that were attached to it. It ended up taking a couple of weeks, something that was just, you know, I didn't think would take anywhere near that long. No, time is a, timing is a very big factor, even in life. Sure. <laughs> Word. Um, did you get any help from the industry to develop or promote Alien Arena? Yeah, yeah, we've gotten some help from. Um, you want to say uh, Intel, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some of these other hardware companies. They've actually helped us out quite a bit. Um, Victor, if he would have been here, uh, which uh, I guess it's like four in the morning for him. Uh, he's very instrumental. He's the one that like puts all that together, and he's he's got a lot of contacts. And Intel has like sponsored tournaments. Um, they've used us for tournaments at DreamHack and um, uh, conventions too. So there's been like a lot of different um, esports type tournaments that uh, Alien Re has been using with these companies that Victor has contacted, and and they've helped out. They've donated prizes, and I, he was rattling off some numbers, uh, and I was kind of astonished, like the amount of money they actually pumped into into these tournaments. And the other thing that the industry did for us, obviously, is it gave us, uh, the game industry gave, gave us uh, uh, the Quake 2 engine as a starting point. We'd be, we'd be nowhere without that. Yep. Uh, how long did it take to create Alien Arena? Well, it's not done yet, so... <laughs> um. Is always upgrading. Games are forever updating. Yeah, you know the initial release. I guess it took like about a year, six months. Um, but I was just by myself then. I didn't have any anybody really helping at that point. 
but like since then, like so many people and and now like the team we have now. So I guess like the version of it that we're about to release has been about a four year project where it was like, okay, we released, I guess since when was it max 2013? Gosh, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So like then we just kind of released it and that was kind of the last version of that, I guess that iteration of the game. And we just kind of redid everything, like all the artwork. And, and so it's been about a four year uh, process, but you know, it's all like in our spare time, you know, we haven't been able to dedicate, um, you know, to full time to it. Cause you know, we have to make livings too. Um, yeah. unfortunately, uh, the love of it doesn't pay for the food or the, or the mortgage, but, um, you know, maybe that could change at some point down the road. I don't know. You know, we'll see how it does on steam and take it from there. Promote, I mean, even, promote. even if it doesn't sell, you know, I won't regret anything. I still had a really good time. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that's the main thing. You got to have fun doing it. And if it ends up turning out to be something that you can make a living at, that's like, one heck of a bonus because everybody wants to do that, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> yeah. I could do several things with my time that would make me extremely happy. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I do what I do, and I still enjoy it. Right. Um, what do you think is currently helping slash hurting the indie game industry? Hmm. Helping, uh, you know, I think Steam's helped. Yeah. Because it gives everybody, it gives a lot of games a publisher mm. that normally they wouldn't have. And there, I think Steam is, you know, Valve is very fair about the way they do things with it. And, um, and it gives them a lot of exposure, uh, like automatically. So um, that's, that's a good thing. I think that's kind of helped it grow for sure. Uh, as far as what's hurt it, um, well, that's a good question. I don't know if anything has. Uh, maybe something has, but it seems like the indie game industry is as strong as it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, this seems kind of like a, a golden age for indie games right now. Yeah. Um, at least from my perspective. Um, I mean, I guess maybe something's something's kind of been lost. Um, now that now now sort of an indie studio really cannot compete with a big publisher where it used to be possible. Yeah. Um, or I guess id, so id Software was an indie company when they had their biggest hits. Um, but uh, you know, in order to uh, you know create what we would consider a triple A game, you need like a team of fifty artists, and an yeah. indie studio is not going to do that. But uh, you know, they have their own niche, and uh, yeah. they're killing it. Yeah, the game industry, I guess, is probably, you know, the size of it is probably what hurts the indies the most because now it's so big. You know, when it came out, the gaming industry wasn't all that big in comparison to what it is now. So they were kind of like that, you know, like Max said before, like the, the, the fish in the pond thing. You know, the pond was a lot smaller. So, you know, they were like a little, a little bass coming around and all of a sudden they started growing and eating up everything else. And the next thing you know, they were hugely successful yeah but i you know another thing it's helping indie games too is obviously open source software has oh, yeah. helped it measurably you know i mean a lot of stuff wouldn't even be possible and you, know, you have to give it a lot of credit for that because they are kind of like i would say they're the pioneers of it but certainly they were like one of the first you know big studios to release their engine out there and now and now, even though like you know, Unreal Engine is not open source, um, yeah. uh, Epic has really liberalized the process of licensing the Unreal Engine mm -hmm. to the point where you can you can pretty much, even though it's not open source, you can download the full source code and get started. Yeah. And I think they would have never done that without uh, yeah. Yeah. without its uh, influence. Yep, that definitely affected them for sure. And there's some other engines too that are like that, that are kind of going into that mode too. So I think that's kind of the way in the future. And eventually that might lead to, you know, who knows, maybe eventually Epic will open source it. I mean, you never know. I never thought it would when they did it. 
Well, I mean, they could probably open source like UE2. Yeah. That would be great, actually. It's, yeah. Yep. Uh, which gaming conventions slash events do you plan on attending this year and why? Oh, well, you know, I wanted to go to DreamHack last year and I didn't. I do not know. I have to talk to Victor. We probably will probably will do DreamHack this year. Um, if possible. If it's lines up with my schedule and, you know, financially viable. <clears throat> but uh, that would be probably the big one. Um, us, that's, a, that's a huge convention. And um, yeah, outside of that, I don't have too many. I haven't really thought about it. Um, I've never been to a QuakeCon. I keep telling myself I need to go to a QuakeCon, but I haven't. And that's a little late now. But I, I mean, I guess I could. But, uh, it's at August, I think. But, you could go to yeah. next year's one. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, you know, how things go. Um, as, far, uh, as far as me, like, before. Up until really not that long ago, I was I was in college, so I couldn't really take time to, you know, I, I would miss classes or whatever. But now that I'm I'm working, I can uh, you know take days off. So, uh, you know, I haven't really gone to any uh, events with uh, with Alien Arena, but uh, that could change. Anything is yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, what do you personally think about each platform, if it's a viable question to ask? Like pros and cons of each platform? Yeah. You're saying? Oh, um, well, you know, Linux is obviously, you know, it's open source. Um, it's efficient. Uh, there's not a lot of fluff around it. At least in most distros, uh, that that's my appeal. You know, that's what it, how it appeals to me. Um, Windows uh, to me is easy to develop on, simply because Visual Studio is you know a ridiculously great IDE to work on. I mean, maybe there's some better ones out there I haven't used, but it's the, the newer versions of it are you know incredibly powerful. One of these days, I'll get you using a text editor and a couple terminal emulators, and you'll love it. You will love it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Windows is, um, it is not as bad as it was. It used to be kind of like a real pain. Um, uh, but really, the, the biggest issue is generally just drivers. Uh, it seems like, you know, as long as the drivers are good. I guess with Windows or with Linux, there's been, in the past, there was issues with drivers and uh, you know, different vendors making drivers. But, um, I guess Windows probably has similar issues too. I would say, John, just about covered it. Um, I have not had a Windows partition in quite a while. It's probably been years since I've booted Windows on one of my computers. Um, that's just my preference. But as far as um, like consoles go, I don't know. It seems like they're they're starting to import all the uh, disadvantages of PC gaming, um, and abandon all the advantages that console gaming used to have. So, um, I don't really see the point of them anymore. It's an improvement. I mean, maybe I don't know. Like the 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 advantage of a console used to be that you just like you put the game in and it works. But now you've got to like download patches just like you have to on Windows, so it's like, what's even the point anymore? Yeah, just, just get a PC. Less efficient. So, and I mean, I don't know. I the last thing I had seen, uh, it seemed like the consoles are starting to lose their market share. Anyway, so. uh, they're still they still sell. Yeah, they're still there, but I, I do think they're like uh, maybe uh, losing a little. Something I saw, maybe I'm. Misread it. It's all phones now. That's th that's what's yeah. replacing yeah, them. Problem mobile is taking over in such a big way, uh, and you know, that's, I guess the thing we have to battle with first person shooters are they're not exactly the hot item these days. I mean, I guess there will always be somewhat of a market. Obviously, Doom sold what like thirty six million copies in the first month. 
I think. I think that's the right figure. So, um, but, but yeah, that's a good point that there are certain types of games that are just developed and honed on one platform that just don't translate. I still, I mean, I, I'm a diehard PC gamer, but I still use a controller when I play platformers just because it works better. Yeah, right. Yep. Uh, why did you start, uh, why did you choose to start game development? Um, well, because I played them in the arcade constantly. I guess I started in high school and we had like these Apple 2C computers and I just was fascinated that I could like get on one of those and start recreating Donkey Kong and Pac-Man on them, and that's kind of how it happened. And then, and then when Doom, um, the first Doom came out, and you could like modify it and make levels and maps for it, and it just got me back into it. And, you know, ever since then, I've never, I've never stopped. It's been nonstop. Um, for me, it was. Um this summer camp type thing that was sort of put on by uh, a local university where they would just, it wasn't like you would go off to camp, but every day you would go to the campus over the summer and you could sign up for classes. And these are not like actual classes. These are just things you could do. And one of them was game development uh, with uh, this tool called Game Maker, which... I um, remember Game Maker. <laughs> Honestly, you would it would be a mistake to not take Game Maker seriously. Even today, it's probably still a great prototyping tool. Um, and there's, I was blown away. I was playing a game called Hyper Light Drifter, which is a really professionally made, really solid game. And there's like a little Game Maker logo on, in the corner when it starts up. So it's like, okay, you can make you can make some real games with that. Um, and I think that's cool. But uh, yeah, that's how I got started. And as far as how I got started with Alien Arena, uh, the answer is alphabetical order. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. I was I was uh, just a kid with my first PC looking for some free games because I didn't have any money. And I found Wikipedia's list of free first-person shooters. And, of course, Alien Arena starts with A, so it was right there at the top. So that was one of the first ones I tried. Uh, and uh, I guess the rest is history as far as that's concerned. Um, you might say alphabetical order changed my life. <laughs> uh, what type of education have you done? Uh, well, I went to um, a four-year college in Baltimore, Maryland, called Loyola, uh, for electrical engineering. As my guidance counselor told me, there was no future in computer, and so that was crazy. Uh, but this was nineteen eighty-four. And, uh, yeah, he, he might have not had a lot of foresight there. Uh, I, I, I did about two years of that, and then I switched over to computer science. And, um, and then before I finished college, I got offered a job, so I just took it, and I actually never finished. And that was, uh, that was 30 years ago. I think I'm, like, one credit away from... Uh, like an associate's degree, but it doesn't matter anymore because I got my bachelor's. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to um, I went to uh, JC, uh, local JC, where I grew up for a while, uh, and then I moved off to Oregon and uh, went to Oregon State University. Recently graduated, uh, bachelor's degree in computer science. So that's that's my uh, highest level of education reached. I tip my hat to you for finishing. Uni. Although this, the funny thing is, um, I technically do not have a high school diploma. I have a California certificate of high school proficiency, which is not quite the same thing, but basically means I I, uh, I left high school a year early and tested out. Yeah, yep. you have that here in Maryland too. They call it like a GED. Well, it's not. The, no, we have GEDs in California too, but it's not. Oh, oh this is a little different. This is yeah. Like, it out GED, help. like you have to like go to like some kind of junior college level thing, and oh yeah, 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 yeah right. Mm -hmm. Whereas the California high school proficiency exam is literally like an exam, and if you take it and you pass the test, and it's not a difficult test, but if you pass it, you're done with high school. Wow, I wish I would have had that here. 
I wish they had that. Oh, yeah. Definitely it's jump a year early. Yeah, it's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's either you find work here in Australia or you go throughout your schooling and then maybe find work when you get out. Yeah. Yep. Um, what types of games do you play in your free time? Um, well, I play basically um, mostly arena first-person shooters like Unreal Tournament. Uh, I still play Unreal Tournament 2004 now and again. Um, Quake 3, uh, I still have that on my hard drive and I still play it. Um, not really a lot of people to play against, but I, I love the bot slaughter uh, once in a while. Um, I don't have as much time to actually play. Mostly my plan is just to come to evaluate. So I'll, I'll like buy, you know, I bought Toxic not long ago and Reflex and, and stuff like that, just to kind of evaluate to see where Alien, Alien Arena stood in comparison. So that when we launch it, you know, we, we can feel like uh, we can, you know, aside from like setting a price point or whatever, but just to feel like we can actually be competitive or, you know, our quality is in the ballpark of those games or better, you know, hopefully our goal is to be better. Um, but yeah, mostly that's, it's mostly research. I mean, I, I think the last game I played for fun was Rage. I um, Cheers. I actually do also have a boxed copy of Quake Three with the Team Arena expansion, which sucks. Uh, don't 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 if if uh, don't bother with the Team Arena expansion; it's bad. Um, but uh, yeah, I have my boxed copy of Quake Three. I've actually been playing that a lot lately, last couple of days. But boy, I have a lot of hours in FTL. I have a lot of hours in Civ Five. Um, I have a lot of hours in. Play a lot of platformers actually, because it's just it's mindless. You can play a platformer while listening to music or watching a movie or something. Just have super, just have mm. Super Meat Boy going on your other monitor. Um, uh, yeah, um, a lot of I, I do like a lot of like you know indie two D games and stuff like that. Um, and uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of emulated. Uh, GameCube games as well. I actually have a tiny, I have a mm. tiny, tiny amount of code in Dolphin, very minuscule, uh, which is the the GameCube and Wii emulator. Uh, ah. uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, I think that's that's about it. I don't, the one thing I really don't do often is just big single player uh, story based games because. Um, it's like reading a novel where when you start reading a novel, you have to read it every few days or else you forget what's happening in the story. And uh, I just can't do that with games. I have to have the flexibility to stop playing it and not lose my place, as it were. Yeah, I know the feeling. I go back to the game sickness and I'm like, right, this is where I've saved but what the heck was I doing before that? What kind of voices had I given these people? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it just gets stressful. Um, what is your favorite game of all time? I have to say my favorite game of all time that I had the best experience with. Um, probably Doom 1. I think it kind of like changed my whole... Now, I played Wolfenstein 3D before that, and I used to, like, have dreams and night about it. But um, Doom 1 was like, wow, this is just incredible. And that just kind of, I, I don't know if I ever had another experience that was quite like, like that. Uh, I, I did love Quake 3, too, uh, when that came out. So that was probably my favorite. Of the I like Quake 3 a whole lot. Um Man, I, I don't know. I might have to give it to FTL um, just because I spent more time thinking about Like, even when I wasn't playing, when I was really in my FTL phase, I would spend a lot of time thinking about builds and weapon combinations and stuff like that. Um, uh, but yeah, like, as far as, like, sheer hours played, I mean, it would probably have to be, like, you know, FTL or, or maybe Super Meat Boy. 
Um, but uh, and I also have endless respect, of course, for Quake Three. Uh, that's that's just uh, that's an achievement that uh, people are going to remember. I think, hopefully. I mean, with Quake One, it's still, it's still an active game. It still has like two million users on Steam. Yeah, but like Quake Live, Quake Live uh, doesn't have a Linux port anymore. Damn it! I know. Yeah. Um, did you ever consider doing a Kickstarter fund? I have one that I haven't activated. Um, just haven't really figured the right time for it. Maybe soon. Um, that would depend. Uh, I am at a kind of a crossroads professionally outside of Alien Arena. And it may be something that I, I bring in, uh, Depending on how much other contract work I can pull in, to uh, it depends. I guess we'll have to see where this all goes. Um, but yeah, it, I was kind of like I really want to use it until we're working on the next game. The fun that, but yeah, we'll see. I know they're they're, they're difficult, right? Because like John Romero just had one fail. Yeah. I don't know how like, easy it is to do. And also, uh, we've never really worked to a schedule before. That would be new for us. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Deadline. Oh, no. You can't really. I mean, like, we all love the when it's done line that id Software used to use. But um, you can't do that with a Kickstarter because yeah. you've, you've already taken mm. people's money. That's like. That's a big reason. It's just it's just been silly. I've had that thing for four years. And sat there. And I just have not reused it. I don't even know if it's cool. Alright, and this brings us to the end of our interview. I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. And thank you very much.